All right, good afternoon. This is David O. Thank you for joining me. It is a nice Tuesday afternoon. Uh, I hope you are enjoying a little bit of uh, the better weather. You know, I always expect an ice storm around now, but I'm glad that we don't have one. So, uh, listen, we are going to talk to three ladies today. Uh, the first is our district attorney of Delaware County. That is uh, Kat Copeland, and she's going to talk to us about uh, what she's doing in Delaware County, uh, criminal justice in Delco. And then we're going to uh, meet a young lady. Her name is Nagar Gesemi. Uh, she is a young musician, only 17 years old, very, very gifted. She's a finalist in the 2018 classical music category of PHL Live Center Stage, and what an interesting story she has got. And then we're going to talk to one of the Philadelphia Council uh, women, that is Cindy Bath. Uh, she is the uh, uh, council person for District 8, which includes Chestnut Hill, uh, Mount Airy, Germantown, and parts of North Philadelphia. And she in spe uh, specifically is going to talk about the 10-year tax abatement and ending the 10-year tax abatement. If you don't know what I'm talking about, stay tuned, you'll find out. Well, listen, I want to uh, just uh, remind you that uh, last week we were talking with Professor Tara Fink, Director of University of Penn Law School's Child Advocacy Clinic, about how to improve Philadelphia's DHS, Department of Human Services. Uh, she is a law professor and was involved in turning around New York City's uh, Child Protective Services um, uh, uh, Agency and its uh, culture. Um, and we also spoke with Richard Wexler, Executive Director of the National Coalition for Child Protection Reform, about reforming child protective services. And we also heard the music of Andrew Houston. He was a finalist in the country folk category of PHL Live Center Stage. And I mention that because you can listen to that show and previous shows by going to www.dbam.com. And somewhere around 4 o'clock you could actually listen to today's podcast share it with your family and friends. Uh, before we start, let me thank Weinerman Pain and Wellness because they're the sponsor of this show and without them, well, I wouldn't be able to bring all our wonderful guests on to share uh, with you uh, information that I think is important, perspectives that I think are important as well. I don't agree with everyone on my show. I don't have to. That's a wonderful thing about democracy. We can have different ideas, perspectives, respect each other, and, and sometimes battle with each other and hopefully also work together for the public interest. Um, now let me uh, introduce you to um, Ketayoon Copeland. She is the uh, District Attorney of Delaware County. Uh, she um, began her career in the Delaware County District Attorney's Office and then uh, served in the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania before returning and now serving as the DA um, herself uh, she has a wealth of experience. Um, she's pretty much a, a local person here, having gone to the Baldwin School, Bryn Mawr College, and Temple University's Beasley School of Law. So with that, let me thank Kat Copeland for coming and joining us today. Thank you for having me, David. It's a pleasure being here. Well, you have got such a great background in law enforcement, particularly from the prosecutorial pr uh, perspective. Um, 26 years uh, of service, um, both uh, dealing with kind of like everyday crimes that people run into, and then dealing at the federal level with a wealth of resources, uh, you know, kind of a broad perspective of things that you, you pick and choose. Uh, everything from uh, dealing with uh, narcotic uh, gangs to counterterrorism and intelligence. Um, what, what has all of that meant? in terms of what you bring to the Delaware County's DA's office as, as the head of prosecutions now? It's really an honor to uh, be the district attorney in Delaware County. I have been a prosecutor for, as you say, 26 years. I actually started my career as a young DA in the DA's office, traveling back and forth through district, different district courts in Delaware County, mm. and have prosecuted all different kinds of crimes. It has helped me become aware of uh, what our residents need and what they want and demand from us as prosecutors as they are entitled to. Most importantly, it allows me to have that contact with victims in our office. Yes. We have a great office, staff of about 
from 150 or so people, staffed with detectives, prosecutors, support staff, and I love the opportunity of doing what we do every single day. We try to pick uh, different initiatives to find out and help our residents. Uh, obviously, with today's opioid epidemic, my background in terms of being a drug prosecutor and prosecutor of general crimes and homicides really comes to bear mm. and is greatly important. So it's given me the background to be able to deal with epidemics such as what we face here today, Delroy. Yeah, in addition to being the DA of the county, and I just remind our Philadelphia listeners that, listen, when you're in Delaware County or any of our other counties, there's not one city. There are many municipalities, townships, that each have different police, for, but there is only one county prosecutor and, and, and so, in addition to being the DA of Delaware County, you also chair the Delaware County Heroin Task Force, and I know that's been part of your effort to not just prosecute the crime, but to get to the root of the crime, to try to prevent people from getting in trouble in the first place. Absolutely. Years ago, I actually started Delaware County's, uh, along with our courts, Delaware County's first treatment court. We started it in 1997. Mm, wow, that, that goes way back. It does indeed. We were at the forefront, as we always try to be. Yes. And what we recognize is, is that there are many people who come through the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, they do so due to a problem with respect to substance abuse. Uh, we revamped our program and in 2008, and since 2008, we've had 10 successful graduations. Mm. Uh, we have 120 people that have been graduated. We have an 86% success in terms of recidivism, non recidivism, recidivism rate. Right. And uh, not only have we've had 26 babies born uh, drug free. Mm. Wow, that's great. Um, Her I, and you yeah. asked me about our heroin task yes, force. It yes. is a group of people. Um, it is myself as the chairperson. We have partnered up with our bench, our county agencies, our uh, businesses in the, in the community, our recovery uh, houses, as well as our uh, treatment facilities in terms of trying to deal with the problem. We were actually in Delaware County the first to provide all our police officers with Narcan. Mm. Uh, we were a big supporter of Davis Law, which is a law which says if you call in to law enforcement or to 911 asking for help because somebody that you believe is overdosed, uh, then we, you won't be charged with any criminal right. offense pertaining to that. Right, so, so important because somebody right there watching someone's child possibly die is thinking, do I call or not? And that's what we don't want them to focus right. on. We want them right. to recognize that their life matters. So we were a big proponent and continue to be a big proponent of call in, ask for help. One of the things that we've started out in our county is our certified residential specialists. We call them our CRSs. Mm -hmm. And they are 20, operate 24 7. They are individuals who are in sustained recovery themselves. Right. And as such, they provide not only a resource, but an example of what individuals can strive towards becoming. And uh, individuals who have overdosed, uh, when they're administered Narcan, whether or not that be by our police officers or our EMS or anybody else, uh, we like to call our CRSs on scene mm. to provide them with resources of, we now you now have a stepping stone. Right. These are different opportunities available to you. We will help connect you to treatment resources. Mm. Well, in addition to that, you, you also created the first uh, Veterans Court. Um, you know, so in addition to the Drug Treatment Court, uh, Veterans Court as well. Uh, and, and what do you do with the Veterans Treatment Court? We provide our veterans with uh, services that they may need, which are particularly specialized. Right. So in recognition of the service that they have paid to our country, we also recognize they come with unique issues. Mm -hmm. And so we not only provide, try to address their issues on a one-by-one -one basis, but we also have mentors who are veterans themselves who help walk them through the system, who help us deal with any issues that might be particular to their past service yes. to our country. Yes, well, that's, that's wonderful. Um, so we were talking before the beginning of the show, and you shared just a very interesting personal story about how you even got interested in the field of law, and it had to do with your mother and your father. Yes. Would you share that with our listeners? I would love to. So uh, I am half Iranian and half American. My mother is Iranian. And when we were young, we uh, moved to Iran. And when the time when we moved to Iran, it was a beautiful country. It was full of, uh, it was a vacation spot of Central mm, Europe. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, in 1979, that turned on its head. The Re Iranian Revolution came to bear, and we thought it would blow over. Well, surely we were wrong. Mm. And so my family stuck around, and during that time, it was during the hostage crisis time, and my dad one night didn't come home. My mom made numerous calls and finally was able to locate the fact that he had been arrested and accused of being a CIA spy. And my dad was American. Mm. So my mom, who uh, is a linguist, was the first female lawyer in Iran in, to, pro to represent him under Sharia law because nobody would represent my father. Wow. It gave me a focus. It gave me a recognition that the right thing should happen for the right reason no matter what. Right, right. And it made me love what I do, and mm. I've done so every single year for the last 26 years. Well, tell me about this experience, because this this wasn't, I assume, like a 30-minute argument with your mother representing your father. What, what was going on? Well, imagine yourself back into the time of a revolution where at 6 o'clock at night it is martial law, where there right, are, uh, right. your blinds are pulled, there are no lights on in the house, we're studying by candlelight. Mm. People are running across rooftops uh, with uh, bullets blazing, yelling, right. death to America. Right. And so we had to learn how to live under martial law. Right. It gave me a value for peace, for mm. process, for things right. that matter. And my mom had actually picked my brother and I up, dropped us off here in the United States, and flew back to Iran to represent wow. him six months later. My six foot four Texan father came home. <laughs> wow, that's an incredible story. And, and by the way, I mean, just uh, probably something your mother didn't ever think she was going to do. But, you know, going back to uh, Iran and then going uh, against uh, like the whole of society and the political, political process to, to fight for your father as an attorney must have left a huge impact on you as a little girl. It did. You know, you think I was 12 years old at the time, but it makes you grow up really mm. fast, really quickly. And it made me appreciate my parents. It made me appreciate peace. It mm. made me appreciate the process. And the fact that there's a right thing and there's no reason to compromise when the right thing is the right moral thing to do. Right. Now, I will say you have a wonderful reputation with law enforcement. I, I, I happen to know a bunch of folks having been a Philadelphia assistant DA. Um, you certainly have a, have, a, have a reputation of being a solid prosecutor, and so uh, how do you mix the fact that you're, you know, kind of like a, a law enforcement uh, chief uh, prosecutor here, running an office, managing, you know, to basically to protect uh, the citizens of Delaware County and uh, surrounding areas with the ideas of how you blend intelligent a preventative and restorative uh, uh, programs into this process? It's, it's This is not something new for me. I was appointed in January of last year by our Board of Judges as the District Attorney of Delaware County, and I was honored and privileged to be appointed as such. Mm. But the theory of uh, providing programs for our citizens, which aren't necessarily only criminal conviction related, has been something that I've been doing obviously since 1997, 1998 when I created our first treatment court. It's something that I recognize need to be brought to bear. So we not only provide treatment court options, uh, options with respect to, we go around our community and educate our citizens about ways that they can avoid becoming victims of crime, victims of scams. One of the things that I'm most proud of is uh, an initiative we also created and started in the city of Chester where we have an anti-violence strike force and we recognize the fact that they have a high rate of homicide and violence yes, sometimes in yes. some communities in the city of Chester so we recognize well how do we partner up with our community let them know that they we are fully supportive of them and so we started this initiative there uh, where there are several unsolved homicides and since we started this initiative, it, the initiative is we partnered up with our police department, with our mayor's office, with our city works department, with our criminal investigation division. The chief Ryan is here today. Okay. And uh, what we do I is I thought Clint Eastwood was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do is we go down and we have undercover uh, officers, basically right. throughout the throughout the week at various times, letting making sure that crime doesn't occur. 
We also go there every week and actually literally clean up, mm. going down alleyways and moving debris so yes. that traffickers can't hide. Mm. We go into houses and search at abandoned homes to make sure that people aren't hiring to fire, hiding their firearms there. Of course they are, yes. so we're removing them. Mm. We've partnered up with the city and had houses which are causing structural damages to the neighbor taken down right. since we started this initiative. We've seen great results. The number of incidents of violence has gone significantly down. In fact, since uh, from 2017 versus 2018, our homicide rate in the city of Chester alone has gone down 40 percent. We're really wow. proud of that. Wow, that's that's very significant number. Very proud of that. Mm. Now, overall, our uh, our county homicide rates have gone down too. What are some of the things that you're going to focus on? You know. Um, as a Delaware County DA in, 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 the, in, the, in the years ahead? What are you really focused on right now? What I'm focused on primarily right now is mm -hmm. uh, violence, uh, violence in our communities, violence against our women, violence against our children. Uh, those are of the most importance to me. Uh, our seniors, our seniors have spent their lifetime giving to their community and when they have in their golden years, yes. they are oftentimes victims of scams. So what we do is we go around and do community uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. Wherever we're called, we do it in all our, our senior homes, we do it in our community centers, we do it in different residences, and we educate them about how to avoid becoming victims of crime, number one. And number two, to let them know, if you are a victim of crime, let us know. We can help you. For our listeners, if they if they're saying, "Hey, you know what? I, I want the, the the DA's office to come out to my my community and, and and talk to us," how do they get in touch with you? They would actually reach out to our Senior Victim Services Unit, and they can call us our Senior Exploitation Unit at 610-891-5249, or they can email our unit at seniorcrimes at co.delaware.pa.us. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, those certainly are, you know, um, uh, very important. And, and, and I like that you have like a theme to what you're doing, violence. It's so much in the news, gun violence, uh, you know, uh, stabbings, uh, domestic violence, uh, all kinds of things going on. Um, do you believe that the prosecutor's office can have that much of an impact? I truly do. I think the role of the prosecutor has vastly changed over time. Mm. It isn't about locking people up only and you know doing standing in court and standing there for our victims that is truly important uh, however we have a role where we can play in the role of prevention going we part of what we do is we go into our schools and we educate our children mm -hmm. about what it means to become using drugs what it means to using a firearm letting them know that it's not you know when somebody's shot with a gun and they have a bullet in them it's not like TV where it's removed by a tweezer. Right, right. right. <laughs> there are impacts upon them, upon their lives. And so we have a role, and I've embraced that role and love it every single day. What, what is your secret sauce that you bring to the DA's office? What is your special recipe? I would say my experience and my passion mm, okay. are really what uh, helps me navigate every single day. I work in an office which to me is a family. Uh, we work hand in hand with helping and serving our community. And my office is the office of our residents. So we are there to serve them. And we each and every one of us recognize that. Mm. And if there's something that we can do to help our residents live in a safe, happy place, then we want to do that and help them. Well, that sounds great. Well, listen, thank you for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Well, listen, everybody, if you want to get in touch with uh, the district attorney herself, Kat Copeland, reach out to the uh, Delaware County District Attorney's Office. And by the way, stay tuned. We shall be right back after this commercial break. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. This is Councilman Cindy Bass. It's so nice to meet you. That was a great, you know, like story about your family in Iran. Okay. There was a, I was listening to a podcast on NPR. Yeah, Oh, no, it was, I can't think of the name of the podcast. Anyways, a story about 
a young woman, and she was talking about growing up Iranian, and she was there at the time of the revolution and just the impact that it had. And it was just a fascinating story. It so. has that impact upon you when you live through something like that. Yeah, the before and the after. Yeah, it's very much. Yeah. And I think this lovely lady crazy Iranian as well. Oh, yeah. hi. How are you? And I think she's one after you. Oh, okay. Uh, it's so nice to meet you. It's very nice to meet you as well. Quick little oh, picture yes. before you go. Come oh, on over, sure. Councilwoman. Yes, yes. And uh, Nagar, we'll have you over here as well. Take this quick picture. We just leave everything in there. There we go. There we are. Go to get in there with them, Nagar. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, it's so nice to meet you. So, Nagar, we're going to switch. The councilman's got to go, so we're going to have her next, and we shall save the best for last. Okay. What? Well, I'm sorry. She's, she's the musician. That's all right. That's all right. She's the entertainment. I'm used to having beaten up one. That's okay. We usually like do the music in the middle to keep people's minds fresh. What kind of music are you playing? She's a classical. classical. Yep, she does piano, oh, clarinet, nice. and sitar. Nice. Oh, super. So this is a live show, okay. and um, you have like 15 minutes. Okay. I will give you two, one, and then we'll wrap it up with commercial. Sure. Um, so you're m mostly talking about the tenure tax abatement. Okay. But I'll start just so people get the warm and fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a little bit about you and then a little bit about what drove you to run for office mm -hmm. from being mm -hmm. in the public sector mm -hmm. and, and uh, Kind of like how do you describe you like your 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 kind of like your your focus which i think a lot of it is like uh you know um neighborhood stabilization and all quality that. of life yeah and yes. then we'll get into the the tenure tax abatement okay, okay. <clears throat> All right, we are back. We were talking to the district attorney of Delaware County, that is Kat Copeland, uh, and um, all that she's doing out there, her approach, uh, her, her background, and what she is focused on uh, for the future in protecting uh, the public safety out in Delaware County. Um, well, right now, we're joined by uh, Councilwoman Cindy Bass, she is the councilman of District 8, which I describe as Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, Germantown, and parts of North Philadelphia, even parts of uh, Alney. Um, and uh, well, I sit next to her in city council, so I know her pretty well. Uh, listen, she and I do not always agree. We agree on a lot of things, but we don't always agree. But that's the wonderful thing about democracy is, listen, we are not always going to agree, but as long as we respect each other, uh, try to do our best uh, to work together whenever possible, defeat each other whenever we need to, but <laughs> let the cards <laughs> fall where they may, that is the process of democracy. And so it is my pleasure to welcome uh, with us today, uh, Councilman Cindy Bass. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for taking the time out. Absolutely. Um, you know, I w I'm sorry, I yeah. wanted to say we agree 99.9%. Yeah, yes, we sure do. We sure do. <laughs> um, what, uh, you know, what made you run for 
public office. And I'm going to preface that for our listeners mm-hmm. because your background includes a lot of um, public service in a state senator's office, mm-hmm. in a congressman's mm-hmm. office, uh, things like that, and, and pretty significant service as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what made you run for office? I really just uh, wanted to do some things differently. As you mm. mentioned earlier, I grew up in North Philadelphia, and um, I, you know, I just wasn't happy with my community. I wasn't happy with the way things were going. I wasn't happy with um, you know the things that I saw the um, you know the, the amount of violence in our community, um, the amounts of um, you know just the the lack of stabilization in our communities, and so uh, my mother always encouraged us to. Uh, be a part of the solution rather than being a part of the problem and uh, get out there, volunteer, be a part of the neighborhood, be a part of the community. And it really just started there and went forward. Um, I've had some great opportunities along the way to work for some uh, fantastic legislators and uh, to really see how government can change things. Government Mm -hmm. has the uh, ability to make a difference directly in people's lives. And so, um, you know, for me, this was just sort of like a a natural progression, if you will, Yes. uh, from being a volunteer and also uh, working in a legislator's office and uh, uh, wanting to do something that was uh, meaningful. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm very honored. Uh, I feel just so blessed to have this opportunity to serve. It's really a blessing. Mm -hmm. It really is to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, When you you, uh, think about what the future holds, mm-hmm. um, you know, the things that you've done, what the future holds. What are you focused on um, as a council person? And by the way, for, for not only the 8th District, but the city mm-hmm. as a whole. Well, my focus overall has been on quality of life issues because I think that that just matters so much. And it's not something that I think uh, has been adequately addressed in the city of Philadelphia. And you can see it because we've taken away so many city services over the years. When you see our streets right now, Philadelphia has never been dirtier. And Mm -hmm. that, I believe, is a direct reflection on the fact that we've cut money from the streets department and from various budgets along the way that uh, within the city that uh, could have had a significant impact on the city's cleanliness, on the way the appearance of the city, on these quality of life issues. And so, you know, I've, I've just really tried to make a difference, have an impact, uh, and, and, and directly affect what people see in their neighborhoods, how they feel in their neighborhoods. And I think that this is something that, again, has been neglected along the way. Mm. Now, in particular, um, one of the things that happened in Philadelphia, which uh, some of our out-of-city uh, listeners may not know, is that the city uh, established a 10-year tax abatement. Yes. And uh, would you explain to our listeners um, the good side of the 10-year tax abatement? What was it supposed to do? Well, what it was supposed to do, and um, actually it was successful in some elements of it, uh, the 10-year tax abatement came online in various forms. Uh, it actually started in the 70s. I think people think of it as a newer creation. But it really started back in the 70s. And through the years, it morphed into, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, it morphed into the program that we have in place right now, which is no caps on the abatement and a a term of 10 years. And uh, it's over the years, this revenue has cost the city of Philadelphia uh, just, uh, you know, an enormous amount of money that could be used when we talk about the need for city services, when we talk about the need for uh, schools, new school buildings, and additional resources for our schools. This is much needed money. This is not money that we're not missing. And so um, the 10-year tax abatement, the idea behind it was to jumpstart revitalization here in the city of Philadelphia. Because for those of us who have been in the city, and you know, again, I'm born and raised here in Philadelphia. I'm very proud of that. I went to school in Center City Mm -hmm. uh, at the Parkway program back in the 80s. And Philadelphia in the 80s, I remember. Did you, did you have to be smart to get in that program? 
Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it did. <laughs> well, it, it, it was a great school. I'll just say that it was it was a great school. It was a great opportunity, and it still exists. Okay, yeah, it yeah, still exists. Right. Yes, I went to Central High School. Oh yeah, well, you had to listen. Oh well, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not ashamed to say. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you went to a pretty good program. I went to a great school. Absolutely, yeah. okay. it was a school without walls. That's mm. what they called it. Oh wow. Um, and so, uh, well, I went I went to the Parkway program, and I was in Center City. Um, you know, a lot of time in the afternoon and the evenings. And I remember in the 80s, you know, there was no desire to be really in Center City after a certain hour. I remember in Center City in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, you remember what it was like. It was time to get out. It was time to go. <laughs> By 30, 6 o'clock. Oh, you better be gone. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and so that changed. Yes. Um, you know, there was a development. There was revitalization. Um, you know, a lot of that uh, should be credited with uh, then-Mayor uh, Rendell leading from the... Um, uh, the good administration and into the Rendell administration. I remember making a night, Wednesday nights. Oh, yes, yes. You know, they wouldn't tow your car. They wouldn't tow your car. <laughs> the grates weren't all down with the graffiti on it. That was, yeah. the, that was a big thing. They yeah, tow your people car. would hang around in Center City on exactly. Wednesday night. And now when you go into Center City on any night of the week, it's a whole different scene, isn't it? Yes. It's great. Yes. There's been a lot of development. There's been a lot of great things happening. And so to that degree, the 10-year tax abatement really did work for neighborhoods in, well, Center City and surrounding Center City. So whether you look at parts of South Philadelphia, you look at, um, you know, Northern Liberties and Fishtown, you look at uh, Brewery Town and going out towards uh, University City and Graduate Hospital area, and all of those neighborhoods were, um, you know, on the edge, yeah. uh, so to speak, and now uh, are very desirable neighborhoods to the point where a lot of folks who, um, you know, these were their, uh, family neighborhoods, you know, right. they, they all grew up in the neighborhood and live in the neighborhood, really can't afford to do so anymore. And so, uh, you know, these neighborhoods have changed. They've really grown and uh, developed and the values have gone up and there's, you know, a, a very bustling economy. But what has also happened is that with this uh, development, you've seen, um, you know, developers really be able to use this as an opportunity uh, in my opinion, to really say where development is going to be happening in the city of Philadelphia. And so it's okay to say, uh, you know, well, I, I would say actually it's not okay to say, well, you know, we're going to put all of our, do our dollars here into, let's say, brewery town. But for Germantown, we're not going to do that level of investment. We're not going to, you know, uh, we don't see the potential and we're not going to see the potential because we're going to just concentrate in this particular area. And so because development has targeted certain neighborhoods and really kind of left other neighborhoods behind, it's become a problem. I believe that Philadelphians said, uh, you know, when, when uh, the abatements came online back again in the early 2000s, that we all made a sacrifice for Philadelphia to grow. We all said that collectively we understand the need for Philadelphia to grow economically and we recognize that this is a tool that can help us. Uh, and that it will help the entire city. And so we all said we'll forego taxes, you know, on these properties so that we would have the ability uh, to be able to, to see the growth throughout the entire city, that it would lift the entire city. And unfortunately, that's not what happened. So uh, I think as a legislator, it's our responsibility when we institute public policy, if we see that the policy is not exactly working as intended, that we have to address that. And so that is what my bill uh, is intending to do. Mm. So <clears throat> the way I understand what you're saying mm -hmm. is that um, the 10 year tax abatement, which basically meant that if you bought property, uh, let's say for $100,000, yes, and the incentive was that if you put uh, $300,000 in improving, you know, the structure on the land, that you would not pay the taxes for the improvement Correct. for 10 years. Correct. And it did in many uh, circumstances help the city grow, as you said. But then there comes a point where, well, you know, now that Philadelphia is a hot property area, people are moving in, mm -hmm. do we still need this 10-year tax abatement because um, we're only building super expensive places anymore and then because the people aren't paying taxes, the burden is falling upon the shoulders of people who have been longtime residents of Philadelphia. Well, absolutely, absolutely. It's falling upon folks uh, who can really not afford to carry this burden any further. 
And it's, it's further aggravated the situation here in Philadelphia because we have about a third of our most valuable property is off of the tax roll because it's not taxable. And that is all of our universities, our fantastic universities, um, and our nonprofit institutions which own real estate. Um, and, and they do a wonderful job uh, and, and are exempt, and rightfully so, through the Commonwealth. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like that places a burden on the rest of us. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so there are many different opinions about, um, like, was a 10-year tax abatement successful? I, I had uh, uh, Governor Rendell on my show, and, mm -hmm. and, and obviously he believes uh, it was uh, the impetus of a lot of improvement. I agree with him. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, uh, it was. Uh, the question is, do we leave it there? Has the tool of good, if you believe it was good, it, it, the, does this tool of good become the tool of problems. And so you've introduced a bill to basically do away with the tenure tax. That's correct. Yes. So how, how, did, how would that work? Uh, well, the uh, bill is, is pretty simple and straightforward, effective, you know, whatever date it would be implemented. Uh, you know, there would be no more of uh, an abatement here in the city of Philadelphia. And so if you already have a project underway, uh, you will be able to keep your abatement, assuming that you've applied and yes. your application has been accepted but there will be no new applications accepted. Now, in your opinion, because there are some, there's a couple other proposals out sure. there. One of them says like, gradually you'll reduce the, the abatement from like 100% to like 50%, 10 years to like, a, you know, why do you believe that your bill, as simple as it is, just do away with mm -hmm. the tenure, why do you believe that is best? I, I just think it makes sense. I think this is, this is really common sense and um, you know, gradually, uh, you, you know, there are some people who think that that's an approach that should be considered. I just think that we need re resources. We, our city desperately needs resources, and we need them right now. And so, you know, you hear different viewpoints. You hear some folks say, oh, well, there's not going to be that much money that comes in off of the 10-year tax abatement. And those same folks will say, well, it's not going to be that much money, and why don't we gradually you know, uh, reduce the abatement and, until it goes away. Well, if it's not going to be that much money, then why don't we just go ahead and <laughs> do away with the abatement anyway? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I think that, uh, you know, when we look at our schools, the condition of our schools, the fact that we know we need new school buildings, uh, I don't think that this is something that can wait. And also, when we look at basic city services, we just can't wait, we cannot afford to wait any longer and we have been waiting for the last nearly 20 years. We, we, Philadelphians have made the sacrifice. It's time to look out for the neighborhoods that have made those sacrifices. In our last uh, minute and a half, be, beyond, yeah, I know, <laughs> time goes so quick. Because you're not only working on the 10-year tax base. That's one of your kind of like bold pieces of legislation. It's very clear, very simple, do away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition, um, what else is... Uh, in your horizon of what you're going to be doing? Well, as you know, we've been working on quality of life issues, and we've been working on those uh, for quite some time. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that you and I, you know, we disagreed with was the, um, you know, the uh, restaurant licensing bill, and I'm glad to say that we were able to have some conversation about yes. that, and we're, uh, you know, going to be having some more conversation publicly, yes. and I think that we're, you know, going to be able to show a united front on yes. that, so, uh, so I'm very, well, very excited about that. Yeah, one of the good things about Councilman Cindy Bass uh, and myself is we don't have huge egos, so we could we could put our, our opinions behind ourselves to uh, to look out for the public interest. Absolutely, absolutely. So but we're going to continue to work on quality of life issues, and one of the things that uh, we've been really focused on is our Community Leadership Caucus, which mm. is a caucus which brings together um, leaders in the community, uh, committee people, block captains, um, anyone who's interested in being a stakeholder in a neighborhood. So we bring them together and we ask them to sit down, work together, and let's say, you know, like once a month on a Saturday, we get together for about an hour. Okay, well, how many abandoned houses do you have on your block? How many abandoned autos? How many potholes? How many street lights need to be repaired? You know, the basic, again, the quality of life issues, the city service issues, and so we go through them uh, month after month for about six months. Uh, we divvy up that list, we provide it to the different city departments, whether it's streets or LNI or whomever. And these are ways to get the service that we need in our communities and to build up the leadership 
because I represent about 160,000 people uh, right. with a staff of 10. So you can, you know, anybody can do the math and see how right. hard that is. Yes, yes. yes. So we need to uh, empower our communities. That's what this is about. And we also have a new camera initiative in which if you are a part of the Community Leadership Caucus, we're going to be providing cameras uh, to the members and to the uh, and on blocks that are affected uh, as a part of this caucus so that you can have a camera system that will cover ideally the very beginning, the middle, and the end of your block to capture uh, criminal activity and also dumping. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us, Councilman Cindy Bath, 8th District, City of Philadelphia. Thank you for having me. All right, well, listen, everybody, stay tuned. We'll be now, next, meeting our young musician right after this commercial break. <laughs> All right, fantastic. It goes so quick, doesn't I know, it? I know. Like, I'm like, okay, I got like 10 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you could uh, download the podcast today around 4 o'clock. Okay, so you can like, I'll send you the link. Uh, later. Oh, great. Oh, okay. great. Right. Thank you. Oh, all right, thank man. You. Oh, my pleasure. All right, Nigar, you're sitting right here. Bring, bring everything over with you. Excuse me. We'll sing. You want her Facebook Live? No, she, she plays the piano. We don't have a piano, so we got to click. So. Oh, but one time we had a huge jazz band in here. They were oh, really? performing oh, live. Oh, it's fine. Okay. David, I'm gonna be listening in the car. All right, all right. <laughs> this is like a five minute commercial break, so we got a little bit of time. Thank you. Kelsey. All right, thank you. Take care. Thanks. All right, see you guys. Bye. All right, Thank you. Take care. See you. All right, Tyrone. All right. Two minutes, one minute, wrap it up, cut. Because we end at pretty much at 57.34. So 57 will be done. Okay. 57.34, oh, okay. yeah. But, you know, when I do this, don't look back there because you'll stop I'm talking to the right. microphone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go on. Two clips. Uh, I, I just remember <coughs> interlude four. Is it interlude or inter what? Etude. Etude. <laughs> Etude? How do I spell that? E T U D D E. D E A T U D E. Number four. Who did that? Uh, Chopin. 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 And um, <laughs> the other one is fantasy. And for piano. Fantasy for piano. And who did that? Uh, it's from uh, Mohammed Hussein. Oh, okay. I can't even say that. So I'm just <laughs> going to say it. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
All right, we are back. We were just talking to Councilwoman Cindy Bass, the uh, 8th District uh, Councilwoman in Philadelphia. And uh, before that, we were uh, talking with Kat Copeland, the uh, District Attorney of Delaware County. Uh, you can listen to our show later today in a podcast. If you go to www.dbam.com, check out the, uh, the menu, go to programs, in the know with David O, and you will be able to uh, listen to this and all our shows. Well, listen, right now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to a 17-year-old musician. Her name is Nagar Gesemi. Uh, she is the uh, 2018 classical music finalist in the PHL Live Center Stage. She's one of five finalists, and uh, what an amazing category that was. Really so super impressive. But uh, this young lady was born in Tehran, Iran, or Iran, uh, and started uh, with the piano at the age of four. And uh, actually, a music institute founded by her mother in her hometown and by the age of eight she attended her first international piano competition in Damascus and then later went on to Slovakia, Hungary and by the age of 10 began her studies in music theory and history. She played a little cello, she plays a sitar, she plays a clarinet, she's with the All City Orchestra and the list goes on. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, um, you know, uh, I'm going to introduce you by way of uh, a clip we have of your piano playing. Um, this first clip, I believe, is uh, Etude Number 4 by Chopin. Okay, so here we go. All right, all right. Well, that's a much longer... We cannot listen to the whole thing. But let, let me say uh, to our listeners that I, I actually was uh, there watching when you were performing live and uh, mesmerizing. You were just, as my, as my friend uh, Tom says, one with the music. So clearly you were just like the, the music was emoting from your being. Um, uh, very technical skills you have. I'm so happy to hear Now, um, you obviously uh, spent a lot of time with the piano. Uh, do you love the piano, or, or, or is the piano being beaten about you? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, when I was at the age of four, uh, they told me, okay, just uh, choose an instrument. And I chose piano, um, like, maybe around at the age of eight or nine, I was struggling liking piano. Yeah. I was like, okay, it's not my instrument. But then after a while, I really liked it. And now it's like, um, for me, music is, is piano. Yeah. Now, now, you and I were talking before the, uh, the show, and uh, you said something very interesting, because I said, listen, I'm not a musician, so I don't really relate to what you're saying. You may think I do, but I don't. Um, because I'm not a musician, but what you said is the piano is kind of like a gateway. It's a, kind of a representation. Uh, I don't want to misstate what you said, so why don't you tell our audience, like, what, what is the piano to you? So, um, piano actually taught me to, it actually introduced me to the world of music. Um, for example, if somebody said, like, let's say somebody tells me, okay, this is something in terms of music. Let's say 
this should sound like this. Um, I would actually transform it to the sound of piano mm. first. And uh, I don't know how to really explain it, but um, now for me it's like, because um, the piano I believe is a very small um, orchestra, and um, I believe um, music for me is in terms of piano. So um, does that make like make it clear? Yeah. Well, it doesn't necessarily. Yeah, it does make it clear. I mean, to me, the piano is a piano. Uh, but to you, the piano is something that taught you how to use your fingers well, yeah, yeah. to connect your yeah. mind and your body. It introduced to music on many different levels, probably levels I don't really understand, uh, music theory. And also piano is a friend to me, mm, to be honest, because yes. it's hard to, um, like, uh, get in relation with your instrument is an interaction. It's like a communication with a person. Right. You right. have to know the skills. You have mm. to have the skills. So... Um, when you know, like, let's say you know your mother mother better than other people. Right. So the more time you spend with an instrument, the more you actually get used to it. So right. now piano for me is like my family. Right, family. right. So you have a personal relationship with the instrument, which is more than just an object to you. Yeah. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, so we're going to listen to another piece, and uh, this is you playing fantasy for piano and who is it by because I couldn't pronounce the name <laughs> it's from uh, Muhammad Hussein Sharifian um, he's actually a modern composer mm -hmm. uh, he's Iranian modern composer and I'm going to explain later okay well let's take a listen All right, all right. Now, you are intensely listening. What are you listening to? See, I hear, yeah, you know, I hear music, I hear notes, but what are you hearing? Um, in terms of this music yes. or in general? This music, this, this piece. So this piece, uh, actually, uh, this piece is from uh, my teacher's friend in mm -hmm. Iran. Yes. Like, uh, um, the composer is my teacher's friend. And uh, I was getting ready for an audition in the United States. And I had to send them recording. And then uh, I saw um, I had to choose a modern piece. Yes. And um, I was introduced to him, and he was introduced to me. So uh, my my teacher was like, "Okay, this is this is something different than what you played before." Mm. Um, it's called fantasy. For me, actually, it's like when I play it, I um, I assume a um, a fan a very fantasy. Uh, world, mm. um, like I don't know, but it's like a not not usual, right, it's like right, illusion right. or something. So you know, kind of like poetry is not prose, music is not words. What what emotion is it hitting in you? What do you try to convey to me? If you're playing the piano, what what are you trying to convey to me? If you're trying to convey anything at all, it's a very hard. So I believe a player um, speaks his his background, mm -hmm. his um, uh, general emotions, his thoughts when he plays it. If I speak of myself, I would uh, speak of um, some of the pains I had. Mm. Um, okay, so um, my I have um, my like. How can I say it? So um, I was uh, introduced to the word of impression also yes. as well. So the impression music for me, um, I, I could actually, I was a child, and it was hard for me to really understand the impression music. 
But then after, um, I, I kind of liked it because it was not as, um, like, um, let's say, it was not as sharp as other, um, other musics were. Like, for example, I played, like, romantic, baroque, classical, but the impression was uh, kind of different. And um, I, uh, I actually liked it because it was, um, like, a whole concept of something. Mm. It was not very detailed. And that was actually about my life as well. Because uh, my life was not very, I can't say it, it is very detailed, but it was a kind of whole thing. Right. And it was kind of a um, blurry things. Yes. In a picture. Mm -hmm. But it actually has a shape. Yes. I would say that's what I actually like. Mm, that's very interesting because I, I do know what you're talking about actually. <laughs> so, you know, and I'm dense, so if I understand <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, that's very interesting to me. So, so what are you going to be doing in the future? Um, <coughs> I don't really know. Um, I'm applying to colleges, obviously, mm -hmm. as a performance major, but I'm not sure if I actually continue in performance. Right. And, um, uh, like, recently I was related to, uh, I really liked the folk music, and I was pursuing it. Um, for example, like, recently I, um, I, uh, I was... I found out a kind of music called Jazz Mogam, mm -hmm. which is um, um, related to the Azerbaijan. Yes. It's a fusion of jazz and uh, Azeri folk music. Mm, okay. And I'm currently working uh, working on that. And I feel like maybe I would actually um, uh, continue in folk music right, right. or something like this. Okay. So, so music's in the future. Not necessarily playing the piano. You always play the piano, I assume. But... But something about music and you're discovering new areas of music. Yeah, with other instruments or maybe composing. And I like I like to do conducting as well. Mm. Maybe I can try that. Are you gonna get a full scholarship to college? <laughs> I would think so. I would think so. I hope you do. But I would think so, yeah. Yeah, with your your skill and ability. And and as a parent, let me say I'm rooting for you. I hope my kids get school scholarships as well. Well, what, where do people follow you on social media? Um, actually, I have Instagram. My okay. Instagram is more active. Yep. It's piano underline Negar Qasemi. Mm -hmm. It's Negar G H A S E M Y. Yep. Yeah, that's the one I usually post other uh, things. And I we also have uh, upcoming performances for All City, which is in March third, I believe. And we have also Jazz Fest, uh, which uh, which I play uh, solo on piano also, which okay. is in April. Well, thanks for joining us. Everybody Thank tune you. in next week for In the Know with David O. Okay, great. So we, we make it just to the end. See that? Come on. <clears throat> All right.